every garden vegetable from artichoke to zucchini has its own temperature and needs and that's not surprising because they all come from different parts of the world and sometimes success in growing them depends on modifying your climate to suit their needs even if this means giving your special vegetable its own little microclimate. I'm Elliot Coleman. And I'm Barbara Damrosh. And if you'll stay with us for the next half hour, we'll show you some climate magic on Gardening Naturally. common form of climate modification in the home garden is a cold frame. This is design I like, just a simple wooden frame and glass on top to keep the heat in. Now, I can keep too much heat in with it if I don't ventilate it, so I have to remember to open it up, both to let some cool air in and so I can work in here. It's a great place to start early seedlings, either in flats like these or planted directly in the soil but we use it for another trick that I want to show you. Now, this is a flat of corn seedlings. Not many people transplant corn because they think of it in huge fields, but if you want early corn, it's a great way to do it. The reason it works so well is, although corn will grow at cool temperatures, the seeds won't germinate at cool temperatures. So if you put the seeds out there too early, they'll just sit in the ground and maybe even rot. So I stuck seeds in these soil blocks, put them in a really warm part of the house, and in five days, they're up and ready to go. Now, corn is going to have roots coming out even before sprouts appear above the ground. That's why it's hard to transplant and why you don't want to wait long. You want to move it on very quickly. I transplant corn in clumps. You might call them hills. Notice there's three sprouts here. I do that because I can then thin them to two and I can put them wider apart. And that's why I like to put them into cold frames. There are a few spaces in here where I've taken out early flats. And I don't need much room to put a few hills of corn in here widely spaced, oh, say about two hand spans apart, that gives them plenty of room, but doesn't steal anything from the fact that I need this space for flats early in the spring. So the corn can be growing and the flats can be here and I'm getting double use out of the cold frame. Now, once the corn gets up so it's pushing the glass cover and I have to remove the glass, I don't put the glass away, it can still be useful. I now move it over and I use it vertically behind the cold frame as a windbreak. This is amazing. It makes it five, sometimes even 10 degrees warmer in here just because I've broken the wind coming across there. A little extra work, but hey, who wouldn't want to go to a little extra work to have the very earliest sweet corn? One of the things that Elliot and I had in common when we first met was that we had both always wanted to grow fig trees. But here we are living in Maine, and it's much too cold to grow figs outdoors year-round. Now, there are places not too far south of New England, even as far north as southern coastal Rhode Island, where people can successfully winter over fig trees out of doors if they wrap them and insulate them carefully, or even growing them in such a way that they can tip them over and bury them in a trench. Neither of those systems will work for us, so what we've decided upon is to grow them in a pot a pot that we can carry, and in the fall, when the fig has gone dormant, carry that pot, fig and all, and store it away in our cool cellar. Now, this one spent the winter in our root cellar, and it's leafed out beautifully, but it's been in this pot for over a year, and we're a little concerned that it might be root-bound and ready to be moved up to the next size. Now, there's no sense in putting it in a great huge tub. It's a waste of potting soil and muscle. So, we have gotten one that's just an inch in diameter bigger than the one it's been living in. And we're going to put it in. Now, you know, if you're not quite sure whether it's time to pot it up again, you might just slide it out carefully and look at the root system. There's a lot of roots in there that are probably needing a little bit more room. On the other hand, if you saw a great mass of tangled roots in there, you'd want to actually slip those with a knife so they'll open up and start reaching out into the surrounding soil. Okay, let's pot them up, Elliot. The medium our potted plants grow in is a mixture we found works quite well. A third compost, 
a third topsoil, and a third of peat and perlite, like you buy if you bought a regular potting soil mix. We stir them all together and we add a little phosphate rock and green sand for minerals. But that's it. This is perfectly fertile for the needs of a fig. I'm going to put a couple of inches in the bottom of this pot because it is deeper than a the right height. And then we're ready to Again, gently slide that out and set it in there symmetrically. Looks just about right. That's sides here, and as we do it, we're poking what we're using is newly mixed, and it is a little dry, so as soon as we finish this, we'll make sure that we wet it down well, so all the peat mix isn't going to cause any trouble for the roots of this plant. Okay, now I'm going to go whomp, whomp with that to further settle it. That's all right. Last year, we got a fig off this plant, even in its young stage, and with any luck, we'll get quite a crop this year. So. You know, another plant that you can grow and get fruit very, very young is citrus fruits. You can grow an orange or a lemon in a, in a pot this size with a plant maybe this tall and get big lemons and wonderful little oranges on your windowsill. But the same thing to remember with that, if you put it out of doors, as we have done this fig, is once the fall comes and the cold winter begins, you want to pick it up and put it in a warm and sheltered spot. What you see here is a wonderful history of horticultural development. The history of what I would choose to call protected cultivation. That is, using simple above-ground structures to give plants protection against cold weather so they'll grow a little better in climates where you otherwise couldn't put them out of doors. Let's start at this end and we'll take them one by one. The original, as far as I know, are these glass bell jars. Sometime back in the 1800s, a grower must have gone into an old physics lab and noticed how these were being used for experiments with creating vacuums and seeing what went on under there and fantasized, wow, I bet that would protect a crop in the field. And this became a major industry. In fact, I have a book here with a picture of a whole field covered with these and people working around them to grow out of season crops. And this was very popular in France where bells are known as cloches. And so these became cloches. And I also have read in an old book of a farmer with 10,000 of them covering a huge field. Now you can imagine the amount of work that was. Each one had to be vented separately if it were necessary to vent on that day. And the vents were ingenious too, designed so you had a little bit, a little bit more, and then by turning it the other way, two other progressively higher positions. This was a lot of labor wandering out there every day and doing this. Now I have a head of lettuce under this one. Very often they had three or four heads of lettuce and when they became big enough to crowd it, this would be moved to a bed next door and start a tomato plant, for example, which came along later in the season. When this crowded, this would be moved next door and start summer melon. So they really had some very ingenious rotations to go along with these. Now, this was heavy, cumbersome, and obviously improvements were gonna come along. And as soon as glass panes were available, this is again in, oh, I would say the early 1900s, the idea came up of the continuous cloche. Instead of individual units, you could run a whole row. And so people took two panes of glass, put them together with a simple clip like this, and then ran them side by side, end to end, down a whole bed. The clip they used, but this is one I made, in case you want to do this at home, it's just a simple piece of wood with a V-notch cut in it, that holds those two panes of glass. When you came to the end of the row, you would take other panes of glass to close it in, and then your whole row was protected. Well, this only got you a single row of little lettuces, and obviously there were new developments to come, from heavy to light to even lighter. This is probably the final development in the continuous close. This big structure 
24 inches long, about 20 inches wide, four sheets of 12 by 24 inch glass, was called the barn close. And as you can see, there's three rows of lettuces under there. They even grew melons that they would prune to keep to the space under there. I've even seen old pictures of grape vines carefully trained so they would grow under this in climates that were too cool. When it got too warm, it was very simple to prop the glass on top up and let air out. Again, there were big planes of glass that closed in at the ends of these rows. And this operation also gave you long beds covered. When the lettuce was too big and didn't need coverage anymore, this moved to a bed next door for a crop that then needed the heat. The next step in progressively lighter structures had to wait until after the Second World War when plastics became commonly available. But growers couldn't use them like they had glass because if you just put plastic on the wire frames, they were too light and they'd blow away. So the idea was to bury the edges of the plastic in the soil and hold it up with simple wire hoops. But that didn't solve all of it because there are no cracks in plastic as there are between the glass panes and no air could get in here at all and it overheated. So people started cutting slits or burning holes occasionally in the plastic to let out just enough of the excess heat and yet still keep the protection at night against cold. This product called slitted row covers, which is, comes already done like this, is still available and I use it. It's a wonderful tool. Now, it isn't good for all crops. It can still get too hot in here for the tomato family. And tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, if they're above 90 degrees too long, the blossoms will abort and you won't get any fruit. But the crops that love it are melons and cucumbers. I have a little flat of melons in here to show you. And when I plant them under here in the summer, they grow unbelievably well in this very warm environment. But even for them, at some point, I have to give them a little more air. And when it gets too hot, I take a pair of scissors, cut a slit along the top to let a little more air out. And by the time the first female blossoms form on them, I remove this entirely in order to let insects in there to pollinate the fruit. Now, there's one even lighter step beyond this, and that's the floating row cover. Now, I like this idea because it follows the trend of grower ingenuity from start to finish. Remember I said that the first growers figured out that the glass bell jars from the physics lab would be useful in the field. Well, this material started out as part of disposable diapers. And some ingenious grower said, golly, I wonder if I couldn't put that out and float that by burying the edges over my crop and create an extra warm environment as simply as possible, no wire, no structure, it actually works exceptionally well. And floating row covers in widths as wide as 50 feet that really cover huge pieces of ground have become the commercial cover that replaces the early commercial covers that we've seen all along here. In each case, they're trying to do the same thing, which is to warm the air above the crop when it would otherwise be too cool. Now there's another step that can be taken. Crops respond to a warm soil, and the next materials we'll show you are ones that are designed to warm the soil under them. This is another favorite old book, and it's specifically about modifying climate in the garden. It's called Climates in Miniature. And the author was a backyard researcher who was interested in taking temperatures of the soil in other areas of his yard and seeing how he could change them, for example, using mulches. Well, he inspired me to run a trial. This is the bare soil, and I called the temperature that I took at the four inch depth in the bare soil my control, my even level. In the next patch here, I've put down a straw mulch. Now, a lot of people know straw mulch keeps the soil cooler, and it does. In this case, it is eight degrees cooler than it was in the bare soil. It also keeps moisture under here. This would be a great mulch to use for a crop that likes cool soil, like potatoes. Now, this is a mulch also it's known as a stone mulch, and it's very effective at keeping moisture in, just like the straw, but you notice it's made the temperature one degree warmer under here because these rocks will absorb a little sun heat. But where they give it off most, is above here. It is very warm in this area, and if I wanted to grow a crop that loves heat like basil, I could plant that in between there and it would be very happy. 
compared to this white stone mulch here, which reflects away the sun, the air temperature over here is 15 degrees warmer than it is here. I don't know how I could use this in the garden. This also keeps the soil a little cooler. This would be nice in a decorative planting around the house. Now I put this material down just for comparison. This is used in greenhouses at night to reflect the heat back in. I thought maybe it would reflect the sun away. It also has some clear spaces and it's letting some heat through so the soil's a little warmer here. There's no use for this in the garden. It's just a trial I thought I'd put down. Now the classic mulch for warming the soil for crops that like a warm soil like tomatoes and peppers and melons is to use black plastic. But there's one problem. Black plastic has many attributes, but it doesn't warm the soil that much. In fact, you can see the soil here is only about a degree warmer than it was in our control. What black plastic does effectively is not let any sunlight through, so it keeps weeds from growing. Gardeners have known for years if they really wanted a warm soil, they wanted to use clear plastic. And notice under the clear plastic, our soil temperature is 12 degrees warmer at the four inch level than it was in the bare soil. So clear plastic is very effective at that. The only problem is it lets light through and therefore weeds will grow. So people really haven't used it unless they want to pick it up and weed underneath it every so often. Well, there is one final development that takes care of all of this. This is the new infrared transmitting plastic that lets the heat waves of the sun through to warm the soil, but doesn't let the light rays through to cause weeds to grow. It hasn't gotten the temperature quite as warm as it did under the clear plastic, but it's been very effective. And this, of all of these, for those of you who want to get tomatoes, peppers, and melons out of season, is about as good a soil cover as you can use to modify the soil temperature. We've talked a lot about how gardeners can modify the climate to make things warmer for their plants. But there's sometimes when you want to go in the opposite direction and make it cooler. And in that case, you need a shade house. And what I've built here is just a little movable shade house for my summer seedlings. Now, a friend came by the other day and described this as a crib for baby plants. And it's actually a very apt description. What I want is special conditions for these little baby plants. And the reason I need it is that they're supposed to germinate and start their lives in the spring when the sun is a lot milder than the fierce midsummer sun. And this is a little hard on them. So I need to put shade over them to make their lives better. And the easiest way to do that is with shade cloth. Here's an example. You can buy it from greenhouse suppliers and it comes everywhere from 30% shade. This is a 40% shade cloth and I find that's good for my needs. I make it so the top can come off of here and then I can come out and water and care for these little guys. I want to give them every opportunity to have the ideal climate. And in this case, the ideal climate is cooler than what the outdoor climate is. I made this little shade house five feet long and just the width of my bed. And I did that for a specific reason. Every week in the garden, I plant another five feet of salad greens. And that means there's always a spot this size waiting for next week's planting. And that's where the shade house can go. It fits into the system, it keeps the plants happy, and provides just the ideal summer climate for plants that would really rather be growing in the spring. Another important factor in modifying your climate is to make sure that there isn't too much wind where you're trying to grow plants. Plants need air, but it's another case of you can have too much of a good thing. Now, the ideal windbreak is a hedge of trees and shrubs that let some air through but blocks enough to give the plants a pleasant atmosphere. But when you don't have that, you can use an artificial windbreak. And this is designed specifically to try and duplicate what the natural windbreak does so well. Ideally, you want something that is 40 to 60 percent open. This particular sample is 40 percent open, 60 percent closed. And the advantage of that over a solid wall is that instead of causing the wind to give you more problems because it hits it and then reacts, the wind is baffled by this. And it's baffled so effectively that a little over six foot fence like this has an effect for 20 times its height downwind in slowing the wind pressure on your crop. And that's very important because studies have shown that too much wind will lessen the yield that you get because the plant is being continually buffered. 
it's under stress. This is actually not a bad windbreak to put up because being black, you really don't notice it and it's very effective. But if Barbara and I are given our choice, there's another windbreak that we'd probably really prefer. But the simplest kind of windbreak is a natural one. And perhaps the best for summer is a row of sunflowers like this, which is protecting our sweet potato crop. Yeah, if you plant them early enough, they'll come up before the crop they're protecting and get ahead of it. Plus, they're pretty. Plus, the birds like to eat them. Plus, we like to eat them. That's a lot of pluses. <laughs> And so for now, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.